Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste, we carry forward our discussion on the Indian Penal Code and in today's lecture, we will have a look at punishments under the IPC. IPC prescribes five different forms of punishments. We have fine, forfeiture of property, simple and rigorous imprisonment, life imprisonment and death penalty. So, these are the five forms of punishment and they are governed by section 53 of the Indian Penal Code. The punishments to which offenders are liable under the provisions of this code are death, imprisonment for life, then we used to have transportation for life in which case people were transported or shifted to a hostile uh, land such as the Andaman Islands, but that has been uh, removed later on. Imprisonment which is of two descriptions namely rigorous that is with hard labor and simple, forfeiture of property and fine. So, the list consists of six points, but because one has been deleted, so we have five different forms of punishments. Now, the punishment is at the discretion of the court. So, in a large number of sections, you will find that imprisonment up to so and so years or so and so months. When it says imprisonment up to so and so years, it means that the court can award a punishment from 0 up till that many years. Similarly, if the section says fine of up to 500 rupees, it means that the court can award a fine or can punish the offender with a fine that ranges from 0 to 500 rupees for that particular section. So, the punishment is at the discretion of the court. The court can decide what quantum of punishment is to be awarded, but it must be exercised judicially keeping in mind the nature of the offense. So, if the nature of the offense is more grave, then a higher punishment would be awarded. If the nature of the offense is not that great, then a lesser punishment will be awarded. The circumstances of its commission. How much control did the person have over the circumstances? So, was he compelled because he had a very big mens rea or was he compelled because of certain situational characteristics of that particular place and time? So, that is also something that the court will consider. Then we have the age and character of the offender. If the offender is of a very tender age, then probably the court will award a lesser punishment. If this is the first offense of the offender, then the punishment will be less. But if the person is a habitual offender, then the court can or shall uh, award a larger quantum of punishment. The extent of injury to individuals or society. If the person has caused a huge amount of injury, then the court will award a larger size punishment. If the injury is small, the punishment will also in most cases be smaller. Then we have effect of punishment on the offender. So, for example, in certain cases, it has been seen that if the offender is of a young age and this offender is sent into a jail for a very long period of time, then it is possible that once this person has been exposed to the situations of the jail. Once this person has been exposed to other criminals, he will convert into a more hardened criminal and that will not be good for the society. And so, the courts also consider what will be the effect of the punishment on the offender. In certain cases, the courts also consider what will be the effect of the punishment on the family of the offender. Then the courts also look at correction and reformation of the offender. 
that is if a person corrects his or her nature if the person reforms himself or herself then probably in the next case the punishment will be lighter so the punishment is at the discretion of the court but so many things are taken into account now let us look at the punishments themselves fine now in the case of fine there is a penal or a penalty in terms of money and for many offenses fine is the only punishment for things like election related offenses so if you look at section 171 i it is failure to keep election accounts whoever being required by any law for the time being in force or any rule having the force of law to keep accounts of expenses incurred at or in connection with an election fails to keep such accounts shall be punished with fine which may extend to 500 rupees so if somebody has committed this offense that he or she was required to keep the accounts of expenses but he or she did not keep these accounts of expenses so this person will be punished and he or she will be punished only with a fine so there is no imprisonment similarly you have obstructing a public way section 283 here again the punishment is only fine public nuisance publication of a proposal regarding lottery so all of these offenses only have fine as the punishment so the courts will not award any punishment other than fine now in certain cases we have the punishment of forfeiture now in the case of forfeiture the property of the accused is taken away by the state earlier we used to have absolute forfeiture of all property that is if somebody committed an offense then all the property of that particular offender will be taken away by the state it used to be there in the ipc earlier but that has been abolished so today the four feature is that of a specific property for example section 169 now section 169 is public servant unlawfully buy, buying or bidding for property whoever being a public servant and being legally bound as such public servant not to purchase or bid for certain property purchases or bids for that property either in his own name or in the name of another or jointly or in shares with others shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both and the property if purchased shall be confiscated so this section is saying that only this particular property which the public servant was legally bound not to purchase or bid and this public servant has purchased or bid for this property then only this property if it has been purchased then this property shall be confiscated but the other properties of the public servant will not be touched so today we do not have an absolute forfeiture of property but the IPC still allows for forfeiture of certain specific properties. Next we have imprisonment and there are two kinds of imprisonment. We have simple imprisonment where the person is not put to any kind of labor and we have the rigorous imprisonment. In the case of rigorous imprisonment, the offender is put to hard labor such as grinding the corn, digging earth, drawing water, cutting firewood, etc. So imprisonment is of two kinds, you have simple and rigorous. In the case of simple, the person is not put to any kind of labor, in rigorous, the offender is put to hard labor. Then we also have life imprisonment. Life imprisonment means imprisonment for the whole of a convict's natural life. Life imprisonment does not mean that the imprisonment will be only for say 7 years or 14 years or 20 years, no life imprisonment means for the whole of the convict's natural life so the person will never be released He'll, he or she will always be there in the jail so it does not expire automatically on his serving a sentence of 14 years or 20 years 
unless the sentence is commuted or remitted by the government in accordance with law. That is, the government has the power to let go of the punishment or to reduce the punishment as per the provisions of the law. But if the government does not do that, then the sentence of life, life imprisonment will not expire, it will be for the whole of the convict's natural life. And then we also have the death penalty. So, India is one of the few countries that is still awarding death penalties. And death penalty is to be awarded in the rarest of rare cases. So, basically courts try not to avoid, uh, not to award a death penalty till it is a rarest of rare case. That is, death penalty should not be awarded in a routine manner. Only in very extreme cases should death penalty be awarded. And the Honorable Supreme Court has ruled that the death penalty is not violative of Articles 14, 19 and 21 of the Constitution of India. It may be awarded in the following offences. So, these are the offences of IPC that say that a death penalty shall or may be awarded. Things like Section 121, waging or attempting to wage war or abetting waging of war against the government of India. So, if somebody is waging a war against the government of India or attempting to wage a war against the government of India or is encouraging or helping somebody to wage a war against the government of India, then such person may be awarded a death penalty. Abetting mutiny actually committed. So, section 132 says that if there is a mutiny that has been committed, all the people who have encouraged or helped in committing that mutiny may be awarded the death penalty. Section 194 says, giving or fabricating false evidence upon which an innocent person suffers death. So, if somebody has given a false evidence in the court or somebody has fabricated this false evidence, that is created this false evidence and on the basis of this false evidence, an innocent person is put to death penalty, then those people who gave this false evidence or created this false evidence may also be given the death penalty. Section 302 says, murder which may be punished with death or life imprisonment. So, if somebody commits a murder, then the punishment is death or life imprisonment. Abetment of suicide of a minor or insane or intoxicated person, section 305. Now, all of these offences are grave offences. In this case, somebody is encouraging or helping the suicide of a minor or an insane or an intoxicated person, that is a person who does not have the capability to take decisions for himself or herself. So, these situations are considered to be very grave situations. So, death penalty may be awarded in these situations. Similarly, if you look at section 307, attempt to murder by a person under sentence of imprisonment for life if hurt is caused. That is, there is an offender who is already serving a sentence of imprisonment for life. That is, he or she has already committed a grave offence because of which he or she is suffering this punishment. And while suffering this punishment, this person is attempting to murder somebody else and has resulted in some sort of hurt. Then it means that this person is habitually committing grave offences. And in this case, section 307 prescribes death penalty may be given. Section 364a, kidnapping for ransom, etc. So, if somebody does a kidnapping, the person may be awarded a death penalty. Section 369 is decoity accompanied with murder. So, decoity basically is a robbery that is done with five or more people. So, it automatically is a grave offence. But if it is accompanied with murder, then death penalty may be awarded. Punishment for causing death or resulting in persistent vegetative state of victim. So, if somebody 
causes death or results in persistent vegetative state that is there is some amount of brain damage or there is some paralysis then death penalty may be awarded as per section 376a a party to a criminal conspiracy to commit an offense punishable with death where no express provision is made in this code for the punishment of such a conspiracy be punished in the same manner as if he had abetted such offense section 120b so it is saying that if there is a criminal conspiracy to commit an offense and this is a grave offense which is punishable with death then all the parties that are a part of that criminal conspiracy may be awarded uh, the death sentence if no express provision is made in the code for the punishment of such a conspiracy and so he or she may be punished in the same manner as if he had abetted such offense that is encouraged or helped in that offense then joint liability extending the principle of constructive liability on all the persons who conjointly commit an offense punishable with death if committed in furtherance of common intention or common object of all section 34 and 149 what what is this section saying it is saying that if there is a group of persons who together have committed an offense which is punishable with death or they have made a group and some or that is one or few of or all of those members have together committed an offense that is punishable with death and they have committed this offense because they believe that it will lead to a furtherance of their common intention or their common object that is you have a group of people out of and all of those people are working together for their common intention but one or some or all of these members have committed an offense that is punishable with death so in that case the joint liability will extend the principle of constructive liability that is all of these people who were together all of them may be awarded the death sentence because in that case you will not consider which is the person who uh, did the offense himself for example if you have a group of terrorists that are working together for a common aim and if one or more of those terrorists have committed say a murder or any other offense that is punishable with uh, death penalty then it will then the liability of, of committing that uh, crime will be extended to all the members of that particular group and all of them may be awarded the death penalty then abatement of offenses punishable with death section 109 so it says that if somebody encourages or helps in the commission of offenses that are punishable with death then even though this person has not committed the offense himself or herself but because he or she has encouraged and helped in its commission so this person shall also may also be awarded the death penalty so there are only these sections that prescribe the death penalty so we have seen that all of these sections are very grave offenses but there as well the courts have developed this mechanism that it does not mean that automatically the people will be given the death penalty the courts also look at other circumstances so there are certain cardinal questions to be asked in all of these cases is there something uncommon about the crime which renders a sentence of imprisonment for life inadequate and calls for a death sentence that is the courts have to justify if there is something that is so uncommon about that particular crime that a sentence of life imprisonment is deemed to be inadequate because if a sentence of life imprisonment is adequate then the person should be given life imprisonment and not the death penalty death penalty is only for the rarest of rare cases so there has to be something that is uncommon about the crime whether about 
the way that crime has been done or about the objectives of that particular kind, there has to be something that is so uncommon that it puts it in the category of rarest of rare and to such an extent that a sentence of life imprisonment will not serve the purpose. Second, are the circumstances of the crime such that there is no alternative but to impose death sentence? even after according maximum weightage to the mitigating circumstances which speak in favor of the offender. That is, if you try to give all the benefit to the offender, if you look at the motive of the offender, if you look at his or her social stature, his or her educational background, his or her circumstances, you give him or her all the benefits. You consider whether this person could have been provoked if he or she had a diminished liability. You try to give all sorts of benefits to that offender. And still, if it turns out that the offender has committed such a grave offense that life imprisonment is still not sufficient. That is, the circumstances of the crime are such that there is no alternative but to impose the death sentence. Even when you have given all sorts of benefits, only then shall the death penalty be awarded. Now, as we have seen before, if we talk about life imprisonment or death penalty, in both the, these cases, the offender has been removed from the society. So, the offender is in no position to commit any further offense in a routine manner. So, both of these penalties should be similar and so wherever there is an option, the court will prefer the life imprisonment and not the death penalty. It is only in the rarest of rare cases where the moral fabric of the society is so much violated. It is such an abhorrent act that life that the court th uh, considers that life imprisonment will not be a sufficient penalty only in those cases will a death penalty be given. So, let us now look at this chapter 3 of punishments of the IPC in more detail. So, this chapter 3 of punishments starts with section 53 punishments. We have seen this. The punishments which the offenders are liable are death, life imprisonment, imprisonment which can be rigorous or simple that is with hard labor or without hard labor, forfeiture of property in which case we do not have absolute forfeiture, but we can have forfeiture of specified properties and fine. Then section 53a talks about construction of reference to transportation, because earlier in the IPC we had transportation for life that is shifting of the offender to a remote place where he or she cannot come back, an inhospitable place. So, that was transportation for life or you could have transportation for a specific period that you give a sentence of Kalapani say for 5 years. Now, later on these transportations as a punishment, they were abolished, but still in certain laws there can be a reference to transportation either for life or for a specific period and section 53a talks about the construction of reference to such transportations. So, it says that subject to the provisions of subsection 2 and subsection 3, any reference to transportation of life in any other law for the time being in force or in any instrument or order having effect by virtue of such law or of any enactment repealed shall be construed as a reference to imprisonment for life. So, if at any place you have these words transportation of for life, you replace it with the words imprisonment for life, that is life imprisonment. You do not have to shift the person to another location. You just give him or her imprisonment for life in any jail. Then subsection 2 says, in every case in which a sentence of transportation for a term has been passed before the commencement of the Code of Criminal Procedure Amendment Act of 1955, the offender shall be dealt with in the same manner as if sentenced to rigorous imprisonment for the same term. 
that is before the the criminal procedure amendment act if somebody was given a sentence of transportation for a particular term not for life so in that case it will be shifted to rigorous imprisonment for the same term any reference to transportation for a term or to transportation for any shorter term by or whatever name called in any other law for the time being in force shall be deemed to have been omitted so apart from cases in which the sentence has been given if you look at any law and this law says transportation for a term or transportation for a shorter term or transportation for a, any x y z years not transportation of life then we will just remove these words so it shall be deemed to have been omitted and sub, uh, subsection 4 says any reference to transportation in any other law for the time being in force shall if the expression means transportation for life be construed as a reference to imprisonment for life and if the expression means transportation for any shorter term be deemed to have been omitted that is for all the laws if it if they said transportation for life it means imprisonment for life now if it said transportation for any shorter term then these words are deemed to have been omitted then we have section 54 commutation of sentence of death in every case in which sentence of death shall have been passed the appropriate government may without the consent of the offender commute the punishment for any other punishment provided by this code that is in all the cases where a death penalty has been awarded the appropriate government meaning the central government or the state government as the case may be without the consent of the offender you do not have to ask the offender whether we should reduce the sentence or not but the appropriate government has been given the powers to commute the punishment for any other punishment provided by this code and similarly you have commutation of sentence of imprisonment for life here again all the cases where life imprisonment has been awarded the appropriate government may without the consent of the offender commute the punishment for imprisonment of either description either description means either rigorous or simple imprisonment for a term not exceeding 14 years so basically if somebody has been awarded a life imprisonment then the government can reduce this punishment and say that it will be for such and such years not exceeding 14 years but either as a simple imprisonment or rigorous imprisonment section 55a defines this appropriate government in sections 54 and 55 the expression appropriate government means in cases where the sentence is a sentence of death or is for an offence against any law relating to a matter to which the executive power of the union extends the central government meaning if you have a sentence of death then and it is for an offence against any law that is related to a matter to which the executive power of the union extends that is this is either in the union list or in the concurrent list then this the central government can be the appropriate government and in cases where the sentence whether death or not is for an offense against any law relating to a matter to which the executive power of the state extends the government of the state within which the offender is sentenced that is if the if the subject of this particular act falls within the state list or the concurrent list then the particular state in which this offender was punished is the appropriate government so the appropriate government can be the central government or the state government then we have section 56 sentence of europeans and americans to penal servitude proviso as to sentence for term exceeding 10 years but not for life so earlier the ipc as it was made by the britishers it had separate provisions for sentencing of europeans and americans but 
this particular section has now been repealed by the criminal law removal of racial discrimination act 1949. So, now it is immaterial whether the person is an Indian or a European or an American, it is immaterial. Basically, if the case comes under the purview of IPC, everybody is treated as, a, as equal. Section 57 is fractions of terms of punishment. In calculating fractions of terms of punishment, imprisonment for life shall be reckoned as equivalent to imprisonment for 20 years. That is basically if a court says that we are not going to, to give this person a life imprisonment, but the, the circumstances are such that this person should be given half the sentence, that is half of life imprisonment. So, what is this half? To determine that half, you will make use of this particular section. It says that imprisonment for life is equivalent to imprisonment for 20 years. So, half of this punishment will be of 10 years. Then section 58, offenders sentenced to transportation, how dealt with until transported. Now, because the sentence of transportation has been done away with, so even this section has been repealed by the Code of Criminal Procedure Amendment Act 1955. Similarly, transportation of imprisonment has also been repealed. Next we have section 60. Sentence may be in certain cases of imprisonment wholly or partly rigorous or simple. So, this section is saying that in every case in which an offender is punishable with imprisonment which may be of either description. That is, if the section does not specify a simple or a rigorous imprisonment, if there is an option, it just says imprisonment, which may be of either description, then it shall be competent to the court which sentences such offender to direct in the sentence that such imprisonment shall be wholly rigorous or that such imprisonment shall be wholly simple or that any part of such imprisonment shall be rigorous and the rest simple. So, section 60 is saying that if any particular section does not specify which form of imprisonment is to be given, whether simple imprisonment or rigorous imprisonment, then this power has been given to the court. So, the court that is sentencing the offender may in the sentence specify that this person is to be imprisoned for such and such years in the form of simple imprisonment or in the form of rigorous imprisonment or the court may even say that okay, this person should spend four years in uh, rigorous imprisonment and three years in simple imprisonment. So, the court may prescribe any of these. So, the court may prescribe either wholly rigorous or wholly simple or some part rigorous and the rest part simple. So, this power has been vested with the court. And then section 61, sentence of forfeiture of property. So, this has been repealed by the IPC Amendment Act of 1921. Forfeiture of property in respect of offenders punishable with death, transportation or imprisonment. Now, earlier what used to happen is that if somebody was sentenced to death or to, to transportation or to imprisonment, then there was also a clause of forfeiture of that person's property. But this section, section 62 has again been repealed. Section 63 talks about the amount of fine. So, in certain sections, you will find that the amount of the fine is already given. So, that particular section says an amount of up to 500 rupees or an amount of up to 50 rupees. But if there is a section that does not specify the amount, if it just says imprisonment for up to 2 years or with fine or both. So, in that case, what is the amount of fine? How do you come to that? So, that is defined in section 63. 
when no sum is expressed to which a fine may extend the amount of fine to which the offender is liable is unlimited but shall not be excessive that is if the section does not say the amount to which the fine may be awarded then it is up to the court the court may award a fine of any amount but it should not be excessive meaning that the court should see if a more graver offense of a similar nature if it has a limit of say 500 rupees then a simp and then a, a less grave offense cannot have a fine of more than 500 rupees or the court may also look at the circumstances of the offender what is his or her paying capacity how many dependents does he or she have in his or her own family how will they be impacted or affected so the court has to decide if the fine is excessive or not but if the court thinks that such uh, and such amount of fine is not excessive then there is no limit to which the court may award a sentence of fine so it can be of any amount then section 64 talks about sentence of imprisonment for non payment of fine so basically if there is an offense for which fine is prescribed and the court has asked this person to deposit such and such amount of fine but this person does not deposit the fine what will happen then so those cases are dealt with under section 64 sentence of imprisonment for non payment of fine so if you do not pay the fine that was awarded to you as a penalty then you will have to suffer some more imprisonment in every case of an offense punishable with imprisonment as well as fine in which the offender is sentenced to a fine whether with or without imprisonment and in every case of an offense punishable with imprisonment or fine or with fine only in which the offender is sentenced to a fine it shall be competent to the court which sentences such offender to direct by the sentence that in default of payment of the fine the offender shall suffer imprisonment for a certain term which imprisonment shall be in excess of any other imprisonment to which he may have been sentenced or to which he may be liable under a commutation of a sentence what does that mean if a person has been awarded the punishment of fine and this person is not depositing the fine then it is competent to the court to write in the sentence itself that we are awarding this person a fine of such and such rupees and in default of the payment the person will have to suffer imprisonment for so many months so it will be written there in the sentence itself in the judgment itself and this period shall be in addition to any other imprisonment that has been given to that particular person so if the court has awarded a sentence of two years of imprisonment and 100 rupees of fine and the sentence says that in default of these 100 rupees the person will have to suffer another 15 days of imprisonment then if the person does not deposit the fine then the punishment will be 2 years plus 15 days and if the fine is given then it will only be 2 years so this is what this section is saying the section 65 limit to imprisonment for non payment of fine when imprisonment and fine are awardable so is there any limit so the term for which the court directs the offender to be imprisoned in default of payment of a fine shall not exceed one fourth of the term of imprisonment which is the maximum fixed for the offense if the offense be punishable with imprisonment as well as fine that is if the court has said two years and 500 rupees and if the fine is is not uh, deposited then the court can give an imprisonment in lieu of the fine but that imprisonment will not exceed one fourth of the time one fourth of the term of imprisonment not 
the term of the imprisonment that the court has awarded, but one fourth of the term of imprisonment, which is the maximum fixed for the offence. So it is possible that the the punishment that was given was two years, but the maximum punishment that could have been given was twenty years, was life imprisonment. Now in that case. If you want to figure out one fourth of life imprisonment, then we'll say that life imprisonment is twenty years, and so one fourth of that period is five years. So the maximum term that the court can give is five years. So that is limit to imprisonment for non-payment of fine, and it is only for those cases when imprisonment and fine both are awardable. If the offence is punishable with imprisonment as well as fine. Then we have description of imprisonment for non-payment of fine. If the court is awarding an imprisonment for non-payment of fine, does it have to be simple or rigorous? So the imprisonment which the court imposes in default of payment of a fine may be of any description to which the offender might have been sentenced for the offence. So it is. Not necessary that it has to be simple or rigorous, but it may be of any description. Then section sixty-seven, imprisonment for non-payment of fine when offence is punishable with fine only. Now earlier we were looking at those cases that had imprisonment and or fine, but there are certain cases that are that only have a a penalty of fine. So what do you do there? So those cases are governed by section sixty-seven. If the offence be punishable with fine only, the imprisonment which the court imposes in default of payment of the fine shall be simple. So in that case, the court shall not give a rigorous imprisonment. And the term for which the court directs the offender to be imprisoned in default of payment of fine shall not exceed the following scale. That is to say, for any term not exceeding two months, when the amount of the fine shall not exceed fifty rupees. So, if the section says fine of up to fifty rupees, then in lieu of paying the fine, the person can be imprisoned, but for not more than two months. So, fifty rupees is two months. For any term not exceeding four months, when the amount shall not exceed one hundred rupees. If it is one hundred a fine of up to one hundred rupees, then the uh, imprisonment in lieu is up to four months, and for any term not exceeding six months in any other case. So, if the section says only a fine, it does not give any imprisonment, then the maximum imprisonment that the person can be awarded for non-payment of fine is six months, not more than that. Then section sixty-eight talks about imprisonment to terminate on payment of fine. So the imprisonment which is imposed in default of payment of a fine shall terminate whenever that fine is either paid or levied by the process of law. So if there is a person who was not paying the fine and so was imprisoned in lieu of that, as soon as the person deposits that amount. Or as soon as that amount is collected by the due process of law, then the imprisonment will terminate. The person will be set free. Then section sixty nine says termination of imprisonment on payment of proportional part of fine. If before the expiration of the term of imprisonment fixed in default of payment, such a proportion of fine be paid or levied that the term of imprisonment suffered. In default of payment is not less than proportional to the part of the fine still unpaid, the imprisonment shall terminate. It means that if the fine was for say hundred rupees and the court awarded four months, if the payment of hundred rupees was not made, and if the person has already been incarcerated for two months, so if Fifty rupees now is paid as fine, then the person will be let free. Illustration: A is sentenced to a fine of one hundred rupees and to four months of imprisonment in default of payment. 
here if 75 rupees of the fine be paid or levied before the expiration of one month of imprisonment a will be discharged as soon as the first month has expired so basically people have the option if they if they are able to pay some part of the fine then the default imprisonment will be reduced in proportion if 75 rupees be paid or levied at the time of the expiration of the first month or at any later time while a continues in imprisonment a will be immediately discharged if 50 rupees of the fine be paid or levied before the expiration of two months of imprisonment a will be discharged as soon as the two months are completed if 50 rupees be paid or levied at the time of the expiration of those two months or at any later time while a continues in imprisonment a will be immediately discharged so basically the law provides for part payment and in case of part payment the imprisonment will be reduced proportionately then section 70 says fine leviable within six years or during imprisonment so when can the fine be deposited within six years or while the person is under imprisonment and death not to discharge property from liability the fine or any part thereof which remains unpaid may be levied at any time within six years after the passing of the sentence and if under sentence the offender be liable to imprisonment for a longer period than six years then at any time previous to the expiration of that period that is if the person is not under incarceration then it is six years so six years is the maximum period but if the person has been incarcerated for longer than six years then he can pay the fine at any time before the expiration of the period of incarcerment and the death of the offender does not discharge from the liability any property which would after his death be legally liable for his debts so basically if the person has died and has not paid the fine then the amount of this fine can be recovered from the property but it should be a property which would after death be legally liable for his debts so it will be recovered in the same way as a debt money is recovered so the death of a person does not absolve of the responsibility of paying the fines then section 71 talks about limit of punishment of offense made up of several offenses where anything which is an offense is made up of parts any of which parts is itself an offense the offender shall not be punished with the punishment of more than one of such his offenses unless it be so expressly provided that is if somebody has done an offense that is made up of several parts of which each part is an offense if a beats b then every beating is an offense but a will not receive a punishment for each beating because all of these are combined together so a will receive one punishment for the beating where unless it is expressly provided where anything is an offense falling within two or more separate definitions of any law in force for the time being by which offenses are defined or punished or where several acts of which one or more than one would by itself or themselves constitute an offense constitute when combined a different offense the offender shall not be punished with a more severe punishment than the court which tries him could award for any one of such offenses example so this section is more clearly understood with the example a gives z 50 strokes with a stick so a is giving a beating to z and he has beaten him 50 times with a stick here a may have committed the offense of voluntarily causing hurt to z by the whole beating and also by each of the blows which make up the whole beating so in this case every time a has beaten z that has constituted an offense but in this case 
he will not receive 50 times of the punishment he will only receive one punishment if a were liable to punishment for every blow he might be imprisoned for 50 years one for each blow but he is liable only to one punishment for the whole beating so he is not given 50 times the punishment but if while a is beating z y interferes so y comes in between and a intentionally strikes y here as the blow given to y is in no part of the act whereby a voluntarily causes hurt to z a is liable to one punishment for voluntarily causing hurt to z and to another for the blow given to y that is if a was beating z and he has beaten him 50 times then that cons constitutes only one offense not 50 offenses but in the process if a has also beaten y then this again counts as a separate offense so in this case a will be given twice the punishment one for beating z one for beating y but it is immaterial whether a has beaten z one time or 50 times then section 72 talks of punishment of person guilty of one of several offenses the judgment stating that it is doubtful of which in all cases in which judgment is given that a person is guilty of one of several offenses specified in the judgment so the judgment talks about several offenses and one person is guilty of all of them but that it is doubtful of which of these offenses he is guilty the offender shall be punished for the offense for which the lowest punishment is provided if the same punishment is not provided for all so the offender will only be punished for that offense for which there is the lowest amount of punishment if there is a doubt if the judgment does not clearly mention that the person is guilty of these 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 offenses in those cases the person will be given the benefit of doubt and given the smallest punishment then section 73 talks about solitary confinement whenever any person is convicted of an offense for which under this court the court has power to sentence him to rigorous imprisonment the court may by its sentence order that the offender shall be kept in solitary confinement for any portion or portions of the imprisonment to which he is sentenced not exceeding three months in the whole according to the following scale so solitary confinement can be given as a punishment but only for those cases where there is rigorous imprisonment only when the court has the power to sentence him to rigorous imprisonment then the court may also award solitary confinement and this solitary confinement will not exceed three months of the whole period but these three months will also not be together or this period will also not be together a time not exceeding one month if the term of imprisonment shall not exceed six months so if a person has been sentenced for six months the maximum amount of solitary confinement can be one month a time not exceeding two months if the imprison if the term of imprisonment shall exceed six months and shall not exceed one year so if the imprisonment is less than one year but more than six months then the maximum solitary confinement is two months and a time not exceeding three months if the term of imprisonment shall exceed one year so there is a limit to the amount of solitary confinement that can be awarded then section 74 states that in executing a sentence of solitary confinement such confinement shall in no case exceed 14 days at a time so even if the court says one month but this one month will not be in one stretch the maximum stretch at a time can be 14 days with intervals between the periods of solitary confinement of not less duration than such periods and when the imprisonment awarded shall exceed three months the solitary confinement shall not exceed seven days in any of the month of the whole imprisonment awarded with intervals between the periods of solitary confinement of not less duration than such periods so in any one month if the imprisonment uh, is more than three months then in any one month it should not exceed seven days 
then section 75 is the last section in this chapter enhanced punishment for certain offenses under chapter 12 or chapter 17 after previous conviction whoever having been convicted by a court in india of an offense punishable under chapter 12 now chapter 12 is offenses relating to coin and government stamps so somebody is say forging government coins or government stamps or chapter 17 which is offenses against property of this code with imprisonment of either description for a term of 3 years of or upwards so somebody has been awarded a sentence of three years or more because of an offense under this chapter or this chapter then such person shall be guilty of any and this person is uh, guilty of any offense punishable under either of those chapters with like imprisonment for the like term shall be subject for every such subsequent offense to imprisonment for life or to imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years that is if somebody has been convicted of serious offenses under these two chapters for more than three years and this person is again doing these offenses then the imprisonment shall be uh, extended it will be enhanced and the person may be uh, given a punishment of up to imprisonment for life or simple or rigorous imprisonment of up to 10 years so there is and this clause of enhanced punishment if the person is habitually doing these grave offenses. So, to recap, we have five kinds of punishments under the IPC. We have the death penalty for the rarest of rare cases and the sections have been specified for, uh, for the offenses for which death penalty may be given. Then you have life imprisonment, simple and rigorous imprisonment, forfeiture of property, where absolute forfeiture is not there, but forfeiture of specific property is permitted and you have fine. So, these are the five different kinds of punishments that the IPC prescribes. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.